this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we're getting you set by taking a look at big takeaways from the NBA's bubble thus far, and also talking a little bit of NFL with Drew Dinzik. Find him on Twitter at Whale underscore Capper. Yes, Whale Capper, back in our wheelhouse for this week and talking both NBA and NFL. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. I'm joined here as always by Ed Feng. You can find his work over at thepowerrank.com and find Ed on Twitter at thepowerrank. Ed, we come solemnly today, I guess, uh, in, yeah. in remembrance of uh, the Big Ten football season and the Pac-12 football season that was and was not in 2020. Uh, so, how are you doing in this dark, dark week? Yeah, it's been a it's been a rough week of you know checking ESPN every five minutes <laughs> to see, see which missed. sport has dropped most recently <laughs> which which bomb has been dropped on which part of your sporting world <laughs> today uh it's it's been an interesting week and and it's really not over no. so the big 10 and the pac-12 made their announcements these are decisions that are are very difficult um you know i think they could have tried but given the uncertainty in what's going on with this country i certainly don't blame them for not trying and you kind of thought that all the rest of the Power Five conferences would go in line, but they haven't. And the Big no. 12 has actually doubled down on their, their plan. And the ACC and the SEC have not said anything yet definitively. So the drama is going to continue. We might, have, we might even have to talk about it next week. Yeah, I mean, it, it's going to change. Um, you know, whether it's changing schedules for uh for like the big 12 i think is starting like late september now um it could be schedule changes for the sec it could be other uh conferences pushing towards the spring it could be the big 10 announcing when they'll start in the spring like there's still a lot of moving parts here and i think that like like you said i kind of understand both sides because you know you can find ways to make this work but there are advantages to pushing it to the to the spring when you're buying yourself additional time to increase rapid testing increase i mean like the odds that there is a distributed vaccine by then are pretty low but like you never know i mean a lot of weird things have certainly yeah. happened so I, I think the buying time during a pandemic is not a bad thing ever essentially yeah i don't think it's a bad thing either i think they could have given it a try i think the likelihood that they finish a the season was not good with college yeah. kids i mean i still have a little worry about the nfl as well and how that's going to play out because it's it's just more of a contact sport than baseball and we've already seen baseball have issues. Yeah. So, you know, we're all, we're all hoping for the best. We all need at least the NFL to happen this fall. <laughs> There's no doubt about that. <laughs> um but you know, and also with the spring season, like I said, like you can get those out of conference games again hopefully. Yeah. And and I think there's there's I think there's probably a little bit higher of a chance that there's a vaccine than than what you think um yeah. i think there will be a vaccine that has been approved by then that doesn't yes. mean everyone in college football gets it by Feb whatever the saturday is after the super bowl uh which is my which is kind of my right. uh, likely time for the college football season to start um but yeah a lot of things to figure out can you imagine favorite... like wednesday night maction in february like That'd be yep. really fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what they would do. They obviously have a lot of things to figure out with the schedule. But I mean, my favorite part of the week was Bill Connolly yelling on Twitter about how the Big Twen Big Ten finally started thinking about spring football uh, two days ago. Yeah, August tenth. It was a rumor that, that somebody reported that was the first time that they had like discussed the possibility or like any of the details according to that. And you're like, really? It was wild and like. I guess, like, my assumption had always been that they were discussing all these options. But, yeah, I read the same report. I read the same tweet that, like, this is the first time they were talking about the logistics of it. I'm like, wait a minute. Because, like, I tend to have, to a fault, I have faith in uh, people to be competent and to talk through these things. Apparently, that faith was misfounded when it comes to them. But, hey, it's a... A, uh, a an undefeated fall for Northwestern, undefeated fall for Stanford, too. What more can we ask for here, at least, you know? And Michigan as well. Yeah, Ann Arbor's feeling good. You know, we're all set. Yeah. <laughs> but it, you it's know, interesting. I, it's, 
it's like putting five teenagers in a room and telling them if they all work together, you can get billions of dollars. Yeah. But if you don't work together, you might not get as much money. Yep. So yeah. we shall see. And yeah. like I said, it's still things are still moving, uh, but hopefully things the situation has improved at least a bit by by the the spring we can get everyone in here because i personally want that data for for nfl stuff too like i want the data on trevor lawrence um i want the data on justin fields uh trey lance at, at north dakota state like there are a lot of dudes that i i need to see play football so hopefully yeah. they eventually work this out in a safe manner and we can talk about all that in the not so distant future as mentioned we got drew dinzik coming on today uh find him on twitter at whale underscore cap or we're going to talk to drew about his initial takeaways from the nba Bubble, what trends he has noticed, uh, which teams have perked his interest, whether in a good way or a bad way, and try to get his takeaways there. And also talk some NFL because, of course, we got to get uh, both these in here with Whale Capper when we have him on. So make sure you follow Drew on Twitter at Whale underscore Capper and check out his podcast, The Deep Dive Podcast. And we're back into our regular schedule here, as always, with Covering the Spread. So uh, as along with that, make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We'll still have, of course, NFL coverage here in the fall. And if, if they have college football, we'll certainly be talking about it, too. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well before we take a look at uh what drew's takeaways are from the bubble want to go back to last week talk to some pga championship with victor hovland started off okay didn't quite finish so hot but uh still an interesting event for sure with the pga championship covering the past all right, last week here on Covering the Future, I talked about some golf again, and I talked about wanting Victor Hovland to win the PGA Championship at 45-1. to 1. And we were talking about Victor Hovland, and I said that I was certain the ball striking was going to be good. The concern was, would he putt well? And I, the reason that I was okay going with Hovland at 45-1 to 1 is that his small sample numbers on bent grass weren't that bad. He's be on a bent grass putting surface uh, for the PGA Championship. So I thought, okay, I know the ball striking will be good, and if he can just putt well, he'll put himself in contention. It was the opposite of that. The putting was very good. He gained 4.9 strokes putting. He gained 1.1 around the green. But he actually lost 1.3 on approach and 0.5 off the tee. So he finished 33rd, had a pretty good uh, opening round on Thursday. So got me feeling okay about where Victor Hovland was at. Uh, but for some reason, the ball striking was not there and the putting was. So a very strange week from Victor Hovland. It was another guy of like a similar archetype getting the win. Colin Morikawa, another young guy. Great ball striker, questionable short game, but uh, Colin Morikawa seems like pretty fun guy. So despite the fact my Hovland bet did not pull through, still happy to see uh, Morikawa pull through with that one. Uh, Ed, I, I was going to feel good with Hovland if like the ball striking had worked out and the putting just didn't work. It's just it's weird to have it not work out, but for a totally different reason than what you were expecting. Yeah, I mean, randomness can kind of pop its head up anywhere, so... Um... You know, especially when you're betting these, like, odds to win, you know? It's yeah. like so much stuff can happen. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll see if we can bounce back uh, later today. We're going to talk some NASCAR later today. So back on that train for what should be a fun race. But before we get to that, we got to talk to Drew Dinzik of the Deep Dive Podcast, get his early takeaways from the NBA bubble, and talk some NFL as well. So let's bring on Drew now and get his thoughts. Covering the present. Let's bring Drew Dinzik into covering the spread. As mentioned, you probably know him as Whale Capper as well. Drew, it's cool to call you by your real name here on the podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing super well. It's great to reconnect with you guys. I hope you guys have had a nice summer. Everybody's happy and healthy and uh, enjoying the return of sports. Oh, man. It's been it's been wild to have no sports, but even worse to have no Drew in our lives for the past couple of months. So what did you do? I know you like your real job, but like what did you do to fill the void when everything was on hiatus? Oh, man, I was I, w I didn't get into ping pong. I didn't get into <laughs> Sims. Uh, I uh, actually it worked out. For, I had probably one of the more successful, like impossibly high ROI and win win clips because I was just kind of sitting back and. Uh, you know, I have a pretty deep social network of people who are kind of tracking down advantage information and somebody would be like, hey, uh, tis the law is, uh, you know, five to one to win the Belmont. And that's a ridiculous <laughs> price because Bob Baffert's horses just got scratched, you know, and it's like, <laughs> OK, I'll bet that. 
you know, and like somebody would be like, Hey, uh, you know, and the NFL draft props were huge, obviously. So that was, uh, that was nice. And, uh, caught a lot, caught a little wind of some advantage stuff in, uh, the NBA 2k, which was fun. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it was a really successful little, uh, couple months and I really, more than anything, I just kind of used the time to reset and, uh, you know, work on mental health issues and kind of reflect on, uh, the journey that has gotten me here, at least from a sports betting perspective. And that was, an, it was a nice break. Yeah. It's always nice to have just like the, cause it is a lot of mental energy to always be, you know, sweating things, always be worrying about things. It's nice to have a, a little gap from that for sure. Just to let your mind breathe for a couple of months. Absolutely true. And realistically, you know, the NBA uh, restart, like when the scrimmages were going on, yeah. I was betting those every day. And uh, like it got <laughs> to the point where I was like, I couldn't really like I was having anxiety and couldn't sleep at night. I was like, man, I'm out of shape. Like there is yeah. a grind that goes along with like doing this, for, you know, at a high level. And uh, it really impacts you kind of physically and emotionally. So it took me a little while to get back into the swing of things. But I'm there now and enjoying this again. So uh, ready to go. Well, I was so, going to ask you, yeah, I was going to ask you, like, if you were betting right away in the bubble, but it sounds like you were betting before the bubble even officially began. Yeah, the scrimmages were great. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I, you know, you, I, I went into this uh, in a bunch of different sports, like same with like golf. Like, you know, you think, oh, well, golf's back. Cool. Maybe I'll bet it. Uh, you know, I'll take it easy, you know, start out here. We'll, we'll work our way into this. And then you start doing a little reading and you're like, holy crap, like, this line is way off. They don't know this guy's <laughs> sitting today, right? Or, like, the first, the first Lakers scrimmage, I caught some media that Frank Vogel was like, yeah, I'm going to pull my guys at halftime against the Mavericks. And I'm like, okay, so they're probably going to put up a second-half line that reflects that. And it was, like, Lakers minus five-and-a-half in the second half. And I was like, okay, they clearly don't know that uh, yeah. LeBron and AD are coming out of this game. And so the next thing you know, like, day one of the scrimmages, I have, like, five six bets fired and i was like okay well i guess we're doing this <laughs> and that was that <laughs> excellent so um you you have been uh what what have you been since the nba bubble started like what have you been your observations if you had to change your model uh or are we pretty much going with what the models that you've been telling us about so uh i basically put everything that i was working on during the regular season on the shelf um, I took the numbers that we had from the all-star break until the, uh, until the suspension and, um, basically just came up with market power numbers for, uh, you know, first teams and totals, um, and applied those for the first couple games thinking like, yeah, they're not gonna, you know, there's some gravity that comes along with where the market was at that time. Uh, you know, obviously there are some players who aren't going to be participating. Some teams need some small adjustments here or there, but I'm fine just kind of using the market consensus and just seeing if the, you know, if they make any mistakes here, hanging these numbers. Um, and a couple of things were pretty apparent right out of the gate. Um, you know, they opened a lot of totals across the NBA uh, that reflected about a five or six percent decrease in scoring, either based on presumably because they thought offensive efficiency was going to be low because it was an unfamiliar setting and there could be rust or they thought the pace was going to be down because it was going to have a playoff type atmosphere. Well, either way, that's a huge chunk of the scoring, you know, games we would normally see in the two twenties, two thirties were in the two teens for that first, you know, first weekend. Um, so I was firing on overs like crazy, just basically thinking like this, I had kind of the opposite expectation where sure. it was like, these guys are going to want to get into some rhythm, some shape. Um, you know, there's a potential paces up uh, and there's a potential defensive intensity is down because, you know, what's the uh, you know, what's the expectation here that these guys really are you know, playing, you know, lots of meaningless games in the restart. So um, it was pretty that was a pretty fruitful strategy that first week, uh, the first Friday of NBA games. I think it overs went six and over and they covered by 10 points on average. So it wasn't even like anywhere sweats. Uh, and then, um, they adjusted pretty quickly, I thought, uh, on Sunday, Monday. And so basically just sticking to kind of a basic power rating standpoint, uh, market numbers has been very, very, very effective. Um, so tell, and, tell me, tell me, yeah, sure. Tell me a little bit more about that. I mean, you're just, you're just taking what the market did all-star break to the lockdown adjusting for, you know, guys who are sitting and yep. backing out what it should be in the next game. Great, great example would be um, the Raptors against. Actually, let me think of what the best one. Yeah, Raptors Celtics last Friday night, big game, right? Right. Every both teams mm -hmm. were starting full strength, uh, and they opened that line. Celtics plus three, 
And you go back to the ratings that we had uh, at the at the end of the um, you know at the end of the re- at the end of the uh, at the time that uh, play was suspended, and it would have told you that game should have been a pick 'em, right? Okay. And so it's like, okay, well, like, is there something, you know, what's, what's influencing this, you know, this big shift? And you look at it, it's like, okay, well, the Raptors, they beat the Lakers, they beat up on a couple other teams that were undermanned. And, you know, like, there was all this, you know, perception, like, you know, b- you know bandwagoning going on with, uh, you know, the Raptors are this hot team now, and they're playing such amazing defense, and they're going to stifle the Celtics, who really hadn't given us a very uh, effective win to that point. And, so there was, you know, three points of value there on the Celtics. And it was like, well, you got to take that. Um, and there's been a, quite a few examples like that. And, and even beyond that, um, you know, staying on top of the information cycles, because it does feel like in general, especially with the if you're betting into opening numbers right now, um, if you can be a step ahead in terms of who's going to be available and who's not, uh, which is an entirely an information game. Uh, you can find, you know, two, three point advantages and all all over the place. Like um, last night, I know for sure the, uh, the they opened up OKC today minus four against Miami. And it was like, man, mm-hmm. so many guys on OKC were questionable. You know, tons of, you know, specifically meaningful players, you know, are, are not going to be in this game. Miami's at full strength. This should be a pick em or, you know, Miami's small favorite. Um, so you get down on that. And Miami money line was plus 144. Wake up this morning and the line had flipped entirely. And now they're like minus 144. So, you know, those type of examples, if you can be a step ahead from an information standpoint, have been extremely, extremely fruitful. And if this is, you know, this is an efficient market. NBA is a tough market to beat. If you can pad your, you know, your winning percentage with a one or two you know, freebies because you happen to uh, be a step ahead information wise, you can really make a big difference in, you know, in terms of overall performance. So um, the two kind of the two key lessons I've gotten are the market is overreacting, you know, like initially there's been massive overreactions. uh, And so kind of going to more stable numbers have been effective. And then staying on top of information has been probably paramount in terms of, uh, you know, staying away from bad bets and, and finding some advantage spots. Have there been more information spots that have been overlooked since the bubble began in your eyes? Like, do you think that books are missing things more often right now? Well, it's taken them six games to catch up on the fact that the Suns took meaningful steps forward. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the Suns, uh, you know, when they, they won their game one, it was against another team that was, you know, not. A, and again, like I, if we had done this preview two weeks ago and you'd said, hey, what do you think of the, you know, the bubble? I've been like, who in the hell invited the Suns? Right. Like, <laughs> what are they doing here? They have no chance. Right. Um, and yet, uh, you know, by the time you saw them play two games and particularly their second game where they were up against a full strength Clippers team and they played them to the nails and that they came away with the victory in that one. And it's like, OK, if this team can beat the Clippers and if they can play that effectively against that tough a defense, like they are they, something they have, that has changed, like they've taken a meaningful step forward. And I think you can say this for a lot of. Uh, you know, you can probably you can find examples that, you know, that go along with this narrative all across the NBA. But these are like these are professional athletes. Some of them are, y- are relatively young. A lot of the sons are young uh, and they've given up an enormous amount of their life and their freedom in order to be in the bubble playing this, you know, playing this restart. And so with that, you know, you really have, you know, you if you're sacrificing that, you know, you're not just here for you know, for the fun of it, to catch fish at Disney World. Like, you're here trying to win, trying to make an impact, you know, trying to uh, secure future contracts, trying to, you know, trying to achieve status among your peers here in the league. And it feels like, um, you know, the concentrated bubble environment has been phenomenally valuable to the Suns. Um, A number of their young players have taken meaningful steps forward. Uh, DeAndre Ayton's defense has been out of this world. Um, you know, they're getting contributions from players who, you know, really did not expect much from this season, like Cam Payne and Cam Johnson. Um, Mikhail Bridges has taken a huge step forward. And Devin Booker is proving to be a leader on this team when, you know, a year ago I would have said, like, ah, oh, shoot, you know, a, a shoot first, you know, small guard in the this NBA. Like, you know, he might be a complimentary piece on some team someday, but he's clearly leading this crew. Um, and they're doing some pretty cool things. And it's taken it took, you know, game three for the Suns, game four for the Suns, game five for the Suns. They were two or three points off, um, you know, underdogs to the um, Pacers, for instance. So that was another classic overreaction. You know, T.J. Warren has a couple of nice games. The Pacers beat up on a couple of teams that are, you know, have nothing to play for and are there for, 
uh, you know, just to, to run out the season. And all of a sudden the Pacers are considered to be this force. Uh, Suns, you know, completely handled the Pacers in that game as a, as a plus money uh, underdog. Um, so there's, there's been a lot of, um, you know, examples like that where you can, you know, point to either market overreacting, underreacting, uh, and really uh, kind of capitalizing on some, some soft numbers. Have you have you had any confirmation that like these Suns, you know, might have been getting distracted when we weren't in the bubble, and then yeah, they're just I, in the hotel rooms. I, if you <laughs> if you uh, the only confirmation I've got is a- Aiton in his own words on Woj po- on Woj's podcast. Basically, it was like you know, hey, uh, you know, this experience has taught me a lot, and you know, credit to Monty Williams, coach of the bubble for sure. <laughs> like getting the most out of these guys. Like he has absolutely unlocked some of the potential of these players. Um, and in, yeah, again, in Aiton's own words, uh, you know, he's, he's more focused and more committed to, uh, you know, being a professional basketball player and really, you know, achieving his potential uh, than at any point during his professional career to this point. Yeah, it's really interesting. We've got uh, a sample on these different teams now. We, we've kind of seen them in this environment. And so maybe this is a time to jump back into the futures market. Anything that you want to pounce on with where things stand right now from a futures perspective? Yeah, so it's Wednesday. We haven't tipped off any of today's games yet. Um, and there are three more days of regular season, right? And then we have a play-in. Uh, for sure, the Western Conference play-in 8-9 matchup is going to be Sunday. Potentially, if the nine seed wins, you'll have game two on Monday, right? Um, something like that. I think that's how it works out. Um, the other seven matchups, aside from the one eight in the West, to me look very unlikely to swing. Okay, so you're almost surely going to you you are surely going to get Milwaukee, Orlando, and Toronto, Brooklyn. Uh, very likely going to get Boston, Philly, uh, and um, uh, Miami, Indiana, right? The path for the Milwaukee Bucks not having to go through Philadelphia at full strength, only having to face one of Toronto, Boston, and Philly, that is a humongous advantage for them. They are priced like they are going to have a very, very difficult round two test. But as we saw in their one matchup against the Miami Heat, uh, like they are completely able to overpower them in the paint. Uh, and if they in every, any way defend well around the perimeter, that should be a relatively short series. Uh, so the Milwaukee Bucks have a very, very straightforward path to get to the Eastern Conference or to get to the Eastern Conference Finals and then even beyond, in my opinion, to the finals uh, without really firing all their bullets, without really playing many games and being relatively well rested. Western Conference, on the other hand, is extremely difficult. Uh, you have a, plenty of teams that are going to be able to extend series. Uh, I do not think you're going to see lots of 4-0, 4-1 type of series outcomes here. Even in the 1-2-2-7 matchup, you're going to have very hotly contested series. But it's very, very, very clear there has been a huge swing in terms of path between the Lakers having the easiest path by far and now the Clippers having the easiest path by far. Before we started playing games, when you were looking at potential seedings and everything, I thought to myself, man, you know, the Lakers could draw... Memphis and then, you know, OKC or Utah and then and then have to play the Clippers and they'll be at full strength and had a couple of soft playoff series to get them one. Like that could be very, very favorable for them. Now it looks like they might get Portland with Dame Lillard, who is absolutely unconscious, followed by Houston, who can score with you know, effortless, effortlessly in this bubble. Uh, and meanwhile, the Lakers are shooting very, very poorly. Offense looks completely out of sync. And it's been all vanilla. We haven't seen their best stuff. That's true. Um, but, you know, you can entirely find yourself down, you know, double-digit deficits in games against Blake's of Portland and, uh, um, and, you know, and Houston. So those are going to be very tough series for them. Meanwhile, the Clippers, they draw... The Mavericks in round one as a 2-7. Mavericks have absolutely no ability to defend the perimeter. Uh, Very, very limited ability to defend in the paint uh, outside of Porzingis, and who's Porzingis' offensive dynamo, but a fouling machine on defense. So, uh, you know, that that is a a series that the Clippers should be able to sleepwalk through. Uh, And then they get the winner, potentially, of Denver, Utah, both teams that are extremely flawed and and or have, you know, major injury limitations and questions. So the Clippers all of a sudden 
are looking at about a 90 to 95 percent chance to be in the Western Conference Finals. Uh, when if things had shaken up a little bit differently, it would have been a much, much tougher road for them to get there. Um, and so you could potentially get down on Clippers at plus 175 right now. I'm looking at a FanDuel, which to me uh, is quite short. I would make the Clippers closer to uh, plus 125 for given this path situation. Um, and, um, you know, especially considering that at some point they'll get back uh, a fully healthy Shamit and Montrez Harrell. That's a huge benefit to them. Um, they will lose uh, Morris at some point who will leave the bubble to be with the birth of his child. That's worth keeping an eye on because he's kind of been an important part to their uh, overall team chemistry since the restart. Um, but, you know, top to bottom, this is, you know, your, your deepest team, your most effective uh, second unit across all of these, uh, you know, contenders in the Western Conference. And uh, I like their chances uh, quite a lot to be in the Western Conference finals. And I don't mind plus 175 because worst case scenario, the Lakers get there after having taken some damage against the likes of the Rockets and the, and the Blazers, right? And you're probably looking at series prices that are close to a pick them there. Maybe Lakers minus 115, uh, you know, uh, plus 105 on the, on the Clippers, something along those lines. But all it takes then is Clippers to get a 1-0 or a 2-1 series lead there. And you're going to have an enormous advantage to come back if you want to on the Lakers to win that series uh, and cover some of the liability. If you, you know, if you don't feel like the Clippers have matchup advantages, even though I think they, they do. Um, so it's uh, it's a nice, nice position to take at this point, in my opinion. Um, and assuming they get to the finals, which I think is a high likelihood you know, outcome, uh, you know, given their path, um, they don't match up super well against the Bucks. Uh, they're kind of their Achilles heel really for the Clippers is their ability to defend the rim. Uh, and the Bucks have, you know, they, they have that in spades uh, and can really make them pay a price there. Um, meanwhile, the Bucks Achilles heel defensively has been their ability to chase shooters off the three point line. Um, and you're not, you know, other than Paul George, you're not really, uh, you know, you know, looking in, in uh, at this Clippers lineup with uh, a special fear about their ability to fill it up from three. Uh, so I think this sets up quite well for the Bucks to get their first NBA title. Um, I don't have huge value on the number that's currently posted, but given that they have the easiest path to the finals and that, say, like, say you get a Bucks clippers NBA finals, you're probably going to see series prices along the lines of Clippers maybe minus 125, minus 115. So uh, if you want Bucks at a bigger number uh, and have – the same level of confidence that they're going to get there that I do, then uh, it does make sense to take them for the finals right now. Yeah, we've heard on the show a lot, um, well, partially by me, but uh, <laughs> Bucks having a nice path to the finals, which I which I completely agree with. We had another guest, Adam Stanko, that really likes the talent level of the Clippers. And um, I've been doing some similar market analysis that just shows the West is just such a harder path. I mean, I, honestly, I think for both teams. I, I mean, I'd rather have the Bucks' path in the East than even the, the Clippers' path that, that you talked about here. So um, I think a lot of opinions are uh, converging there. Yeah. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And Bucks, uh, you know, you can make a case, a, a, a weakish case, uh, that the Raptors had things figured out to a degree with how to limit Giannis last year in the Eastern Conference Finals. But he's taken such a meaningful step forward. <laughs> Uh, it's think, very, very tough for me to see that have, happening again. I think you have to acknowledge some of the randomness in that. Yeah, they, they did an unbelievable job getting in front of Giannis. But if you're really going to expect Marcus all to pull that trick off twi- two years in a row, another year of advanced age, um, yeah. I, I just don't see it. Yeah, he's been limited from an injury standpoint, even in the restart, too. So I don't know if you're going to be seeing 100 percent healthy uh, Marcus all out there. And, you know, let's just say that they do play the Bucks close. Right. Mm-hmm. Let's just say that those games do come down to last shot. Right? right. The the Raptors do not have what they had last year, which was Kawhi Leonard being able to right. manufacture whatever he wanted, whatever look he right. felt like was the biggest advantage. He you know, he was playing their defense masterfully last year, and they don't have that piece this year. Pascal Siakam is not that offensive producer in terms of creating his own shot. And if I'm the Bucks and I'm you know, and, and you know, granted Budenholzer, not my coach. He's not my guy. Like I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't go to war with Budenholzer as my my general because I don't love his ability to adjust in series. But that doesn't change the fact that from a talent standpoint, they are light years better than the Raptors. And in an end of game situation, you can basically say, okay, 
Kyle Lowry, Fred Van Vliet, give one of them the ball. We are going to defend you as close as we can at the perimeter and give you a free path to the hoop and play honest defense and not foul you. Like, we dare you to finish over our length. Like, that is a terrible, terrible, terrible position to be in if that's what they decide to give you. Uh, and, uh, and on the flip side, they have so many ways they can hurt you offensively, even against the tremendous defense that the Raptors uh, you know, can play, uh, that I, I just have a tough time seeing how the Raptors pull off four, four victories against this team uh, in a playoff setting. Yeah, uh, so some good takeaways from the bubble so far, talking about avoiding overreactions and potentially some value on the Bucks and the Clippers. Let's move to the NFL side now because we got you here. Might as well take advantage of all your knowledge here and talk about the NFL less than a month away from the opening game of the season. So what's your thought process going to the NFL? Are you going to be going at things, playing things pretty straight as you did with the NBA? Or how do you want to view things initially when the NFL kicks off? Oof, man. NFL is a very, very uh, tough, tough beast this year because we have absolutely no information from the preseason to yeah. inform, uh, you know, progress of young player development. Right. And so if you can uh, if you can glean from what we're getting and we're getting so, 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 so little out of camp, yeah. like it is really, 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 really tough to glean useful information out of what is going on right now in training. Even camps. like with injuries in camp, Even which is injuries, usually way better. And even that's been tough. It is really, really, really tough, uh, which means, you know, you either have, uh, you know, a, a very clear kind of development curve for a given player and you just stick to that curve and say, OK, well, this guy's going to make this leap forward. Uh, or, you know, you entirely steer clear of teams that are going to be relying on young players. Um, and I would even go farther and say overall, the offseason felt like the rich got richer in the NFL, like. The, you know, the teams like the Chiefs and the Ravens, not only do they retain all of their coordinators um, and they keep all of their, you know, principal players, um, but they added depth at, you know, at locate you know, at some of their weaknesses, uh, which is pretty, you know, pretty advantageous place to be. Um, and, you know, that goes for the likes of the San Francisco and, you know, the Saints as well in the, in the NFC. And so, you know, overall, this idea that sort of these established contenders and franchises are going to be sharp. Uh, and have their act together uh, early in the season, I think, is a reasonable assumption. Uh, meanwhile, teams like the Panthers, teams like uh, uh, the Vikings, who you know are going to be lining lining up a ton of rookies uh, early. Uh, what, you know, what kind of what kind of performance are you expecting to really see out of these guys? Is a huge question mark. Um, you know, the uh, there are and there are a couple of there will be a couple of obvious places to take advantage of this early in the season, I think, um, you know, where you can find, you know, relatively uh, intact uh, coaching staffs and, and key players um, going up against uh, teams that are leaning heavily into the youth movement. So there'll be some good advantages in that regard. Raiders week one, maybe only that's one of my favorite uh, week one plays I already locked in um, because I. I just can't make any sense of what you're going to get out of that, uh, that th those rookies that are going to be out there on defense. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's, there's a number of, of, uh, of matchups like that that I think will manifest over the first four weeks of the season. Nice. So, Drew, last season you talked about how you essentially chucked home field from your model uh, at some point <laughs> during the season because of the data that we were seeing in the current model. It turned out that road teams scored more points than home teams last year in the NFL. And even though we're not going to have fans, or not as many fans, uh, depending on the stadium this year, uh, I predict that there's going to be more home field than there was last year. <laughs> That's not crazy. Well, what uh, What are you thinking in terms of home field? How, how, how are you going to account for that? Well, I think it's a good bet that there's going to be more home field than there was last year, just yeah, because yeah. there was there was none, <laughs> and so there's there's going to be find some. some yeah. There'll be some regression back towards that, I would guess, um, and for sure uh, there's going to be a very difficult. You know, there will be unknown um, challenges with travel, uh, especially like kind of what were easy trips for teams where you maybe you go Saturday. It's a short flight. You check into the hotel. Everybody's having a good time. They're prepped. They're ready. They get up Sunday morning, ready to go. Like now, all of a sudden, you know, you're potentially crunching that down into same day travel. Um, don't I don't like that at all. I, you know, I do not love, uh, you know, teams kind of leaning into this oh well we may go you know same day same day travel as, as potentially problematic big time um and sure. you know i think uh without question uh you know the the uh the home field 
advantages that manifest from crowd noise were often over a little overstated. I thought um, I didn't, you know, there were, there were really only a couple of stadiums in the NFL where I think you can account for even a point worth of advantage when it comes to, uh, to stadium crowd noise. Um, and it has to be the right team too. I mean, like crowd noise only helps you in so far as you have say a pass rush that can gain a half a second, you know, uh, you know, or, or a little bit of, uh, of an advantage over your offensive line who can't communicate as well. Right. Like there's, there's a very specific, uh, you know, way that that manifests and it's not like the, you know, that there's not like a, a clear line in my mind of, Oh, well, the louder the crowd, the better you play. Um, there may be a connection between crowd noise and defensive aggressiveness. I could buy that argument. Um, and we may see defenses aren't as willing to kind of, you know, play specific players aren't as willing to kind of, you know, put themselves on the line uh, in terms of just the physical risks that come with playing football. Like I'm, I'm prepared to, uh, to make adjustments based on that. If depending on what we see the first couple of weeks. Um, but overall, I do think home field advantage uh, will likely still be in the two, two and a half ish point range uh, on average this season. Uh, and even in the absence of, uh, of crowds. Yeah, I think the travel component is something that still, still matters a lot, especially because, like, when we've been looking at, like, the Bundesliga and the EPL, like, the travel there is much more compact versus the NFL where you are – I mean, I know that, like, you're not, not a lot of, you know, cross-country trips necessarily, but, like, it's still travel, and that still does matter from, like, an effectiveness perspective. Yeah, without a doubt. And just being outside of your norms and, sure. uh, you know, just your body clock changing, things like that, out, that absolutely all matters. Um, it's also worth keeping an eye on. Uh, I think there were seven teams this year that specifically requested with their travel that they got back to back opposite coast road games, mm-hmm. uh, which mm-hmm. was that manifest as a meaningful advantage for the road team last year. Um, and right. I would just kind of attribute that to the sort of the same concept we were talking about with the bubble and sort yeah. of the concentrated like preparation, like, you know, Hey, we're going on the road for a week here. We're going to have, you know, everybody's going to be together and, you know, for these, you know, these constant, you know, these, uh, very concentrated practices where, you know, we're going to get to really, uh, you know, lean into development and, you know, assignments and roles and responsibilities and things like that, less distractions that you would have just kind of conducting yourself in your normal daily life at home. Um, and in a handful of examples we had from last season, notably the Saints the week before they played the, the Seahawks in Seattle, the Niners did it twice yep. uh, the week before they played the Bengals and the week before they played the Saints. Um, you know, those and back in the day, the Patriots used to do this a couple of times uh, as well when they were going West Coast back to back. Um, and I feel like you get a very, very complete effort out of these teams uh, when you get a full week of, of concentrated preparation. And this relies, of course, entirely on you have a coaching staff that is doing sure. a good job of <laughs> telling <laughs> these guys what to do. Right. Like if you have a poor coaching, you know, if you have a if you have a 30th best, best staff in the league and. You spend a week over, you know, on the other side of the coast trying to teach you guys what to do, but they don't not giving them the right assignments. That obviously doesn't help. Uh, but uh, but for sure, um, that'll be worth keeping an eye on because a bunch of the back to back travel is uh, is early in the season, especially the West Coast teams traveling east. So uh, that'll be fun to watch and, and evaluate the, the, the impact of that. Yeah, 49ers did it like weeks one and two, like right off the bat last year. And uh, it was kind of the signal that they might be uh, an interesting team to keep track of that year. Let's talk about the futures market because you alluded to teams that have a lot of continuity. And you mentioned the Chiefs and the Ravens as teams with not only player continuity, but also coaching continuity. They're the two favorites right now. Uh, The Chiefs plus 650, uh, the Ravens plus 700. Do you find value in those numbers, or is there anyone else who stands out to you as potentially benefiting from the weird offseason we've had? Yeah, the, um, those are fair prices, um, and I think you're going to be able to do better. Uh, well, for sure, you're going to be able to do better with the Ravens in season. Um, the Ravens have a middle stretch of the season that is extremely difficult. Uh, it is going to be late in this season before we even know that they are going to win the AFC North. Uh, both the Steelers and the and the um, Browns are legit. Um, you know they're not like you know they're not Super Bowl winning contenders in my opinion, but they for sure uh, have easier schedules than the Ravens and um, you know and, and complete teams. Uh, so they should absolutely be in the conversation. So we're not going to know that the Ravens win the uh, the AFC North until quite late in the season, and they actually also have 
kind of the easiest home stretch. The last three weeks for them uh, are, ex- you know, just very winnable games. So um, I'm going to be looking for a buy opportunity on the Ravens sometime in November. Um, and uh, I think you're going to be able to do a lot better than plus six fifty. Uh, would you say plus seven fifty for the yeah, Ravens? Seven to one for them. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm looking for a buy price closer to say ten to fifteen to one when it's okay. unclear if they're even going to win the AFC North. Um, and I like their chances to win it all this year, just based on the fact that you now have two uh, two playoff games under his belt for Lamar Jackson. Likelihood that you see uh, you know another um, relative stinker at least from him, I think is low. Uh, I like that, uh, you know, he has another year to develop chemistry with some of his wide receiving weapons as well. Um, and, you know, I like the addition of J.K. Dobbins on the Ravens. I think overall my I'm going to, um, you know, be I know this winter I'm going to end up you know, back on the Ravens bandwagon and, you know, uh, in some way, shape or fashion. Uh, I just need to time the entry a, a little bit, uh, a little bit better than preseason um, and in pre and in preseason betting. I'm not looking anywhere in the AFC at all. Um, I think the AFC is reasonably fairly priced in terms of where it will land. I think an AFC championship game, if it's not uh, KC Baltimore, would be a shock, shocking upset. <laughs> there's, there's a relatively high likelihood that one of those two teams gets there. Um, and I can't really make a case that there's any other team in the AFC that can reasonably steal the number one overall seed. Uh, you're going to need to win 13-ish games. That would be a huge surprise for a team like Tennessee or Indy or, uh, or you know, or even you know the the Steelers or or Browns uh, for that matter. And so I think uh, one of those two will get the the number one overall seed, and that'll be your uh, you know your presumptive favorite at the time the playoffs kick off. Um, but uh, so basically, it comes down to looking in the NFC, trying to find the right entry point trying to figure out who's going to go, you know, who's, who's going to get shorter as the season goes on versus, um, you know, who could potentially come on later in the year. Um, and I'm a little cooler on the Saints likelihood of winning the N- NFC South this year, not just because, um, you know, they are, they are one of the teams that does benefit from crowd noise. Like the Superdome is a rocking environment. Uh, and they, you know, they take a, a little bit of a bite out of their home field advantage this season. That's notable um, on top of the fact that they have a brutal stretch after their first five, six, seven games, that could see them be six and one, seven and zero. Oh. That wouldn't shock me at all. Um, but then they go absolutely to schedule hell uh, after that, and uh, it's going to be an extreme, you know, like a six-game stretch where I can entirely see them go three and three. People start to dismiss them. Uh, they may be a, a decent buy-in spot at that point if they have any chance of catching the Bucks to win the NFC South. Um, and I, so I guess I've kind of talked myself really into. Um, the Niners being the only team in the NFC that I see meaningful value on now, uh, they're in the toughest division, in my opinion, in the NFC West. Uh, all of those divisional battles that they have will be extremely difficult. Um, Seahawks always play them tough. Rams always play them tough. Um, but they, they did a nice job, in my opinion, of backfilling some of the potential losses that would contribute to a Super Bowl hangover, notably getting Trent Williams uh, to replace the retirement of Joe Staley was huge. Um, you know, giving, uh, you know, some of their draft picks, getting Kinlaw, uh, to replace Buckner was pretty nice call by them. Uh, and they, so they still have the strength and the depth that makes, that should, uh, help this defense perform, uh, relatively well, especially against teams that have weak offensive lines, uh, notably the Rams and the Seahawks, um, and then the Cardinals for that matter. So I, I do tip them as the advantage across all of their divisional matchups. Uh, and I like the way their schedule is set up in terms of, uh, kind of a soft, start to get some of their players back and healthy and back into rhythm uh, and kind of build into their season and clinch the number one seed in the NFC. So I think the Niners are only going to get shorter from here. uh, And I don't mind betting them to win the NFC at this point. Uh, And I'm going to look for opportunities to get, uh, uh, get down. I, cause I, I think realistically, I don't hold the Dallas Cowboys as true contenders because their defense is just way, 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 way too poor. Um, you know, they, if they're winning a game, it's because they scored 35 or 42. It's not because they've held your opponent to 15. So it's, it's going to be, um, uh, all about the offense with Dallas. And at some point that presents problems, uh, you know, come playoff time, uh, similarly Phil- Philadelphia's injuries and, 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 uh, some of their, uh, their thin, um, uh, thin positional groups are concerning for me. Um, and the NFC North is just a mess. I don't think there's a true contender in that division. I don't like the off season, uh, the off season, they kind of had competingly poor off seasons. I felt <laughs> like, uh, between the Packers and the bears, 
Uh, the Vikings are going to war with a number of rookies that spells trouble for me on the defense. Uh, so the Lions could potentially steal the NFC North. I don't, uh, I don't know if I'm going to put a ton of stake into that, but uh, you know, whoever emerges from that div- division is going to be uh, an easy out in the playoffs. So I think you're reasonably only looking at um, about four contenders in the NFC this year, which is, uh, I would say, in order, uh, the Niners, uh, the Saints, the Bucks, uh, and the Seahawks. All right, that is Drew Dinzik. Make sure you give him a follow on Twitter, at whale underscore capper. Make sure you check out the podcast as well, the Deep Dive Podcast. Just search that wherever you get your podcast. Drew, I appreciate you spending this time with us today, talking both NBA and NFL. As always, it was a pleasure, and good luck uh, with the rest of your bubble bets as well. Hey, thanks again for having me. Best of luck, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Drew Dinzik for swinging by and breaking down the NBA and talking some NFL as well. And Ed, I feel like this we have to be the official podcast of the Milwaukee Bucks at this point. I know we're not alone in liking the Bucks, but you were on them. Stanka was on them. Now we got we got Drew on them too. So I think that although we're not in the minority, this is now the official podcast of the Milwaukee Bucks fan club. Yeah, I think Adam Stanko really liked the Clippers. I think there was more okay. more yeah. words of praise there. But I think that Drew mentioned the same things that I was really high on about the Bucks. basically the path to the finals. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't can't emphasize that enough, right? The East is not the same conference as the West. I think we're going to see that play out. Um, you know, like, uh, I think questioning the Lakers, like getting through a couple series to even get to the West, Western Conference Finals is is not out of the question right now even though in a lot of places they're the betting favorite to win a title. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a fun conversation with Drew as always. Make sure you give Drew a follow on Twitter at whale underscore capper and check out the Deep Dive podcast. For years, Numberfire's premium subscription service has provided our users with expert analysis, survivor pool tools, and most importantly, the fantasy football draft kit all for up to $49.99 a month. Now, as a way of saying thank you to our community for years of support, Numberfire is rolling out a new premium package for just $9.99 a month that will provide you with all the sports betting and daily fantasy tools you need year-round. The best part is, that expert analysis, those survivor tools, and yes, even the draft kit are now free. Also includes my rankings and those of J.J. Zacharyson and Brandon Gadula for this year's NFL season. Head to numberfire.com and check out the new and improved site and take advantage of the new premium package. Let's move into covering the future for today, Ed. Last week was a big week in the NFL because the opt-out deadline hit and there were a lot of teams that were impacted in a, in a decently major way by the opt-outs. What you did is you want to look at the market change on those teams. What did you see in the markets after all the opt-outs hit? Yeah, I mean, I kind of want to filter through the noise. There were 60-some players that decided to opt out. Not all of them matter. You know, I don't know if we care about the backup fullback for <laughs> any of the 32 teams. So let's see how the market's moved. Give it a couple days and... Uh, And what I look at is how the prices on a win total have changed. So I'm going to take the win totals. I'm going to take the prices for teams that go over and under, and I'm going to back out a rating. So I use FanDuel's numbers. And just for example, you know, Seattle was at nine and a half wins. And uh, about a month ago, they were plus 120 to go over nine and a half wins. Well, that's gotten a little shorter. They're plus 105 now to go over nine and a half wins. And so when I back out a rating for Seattle, I, ha- I have to move it up a little bit, right? Because they have to have a higher chance to go over 9.5 to match what the markets are saying. So how much did I have to bump up Seattle? We'll get there in a sec. Most of the teams didn't change, but a couple of teams did move pretty big. And not unexpectedly, the biggest mover was New England. Uh, Donta Hightower and Patrick Chung, two starters on the defense, decided to opt out for the season. Marcus Cannon... Uh, starting offensive tackle also decided to go out as well. Um, so they actually moved down an entire point in my preseason market rankings. So that's a lot. That's more than they moved up when they signed Cam Newton. So it's been a little bit of a roller coaster in terms of what the markets are thinking about the New England Patriots. Uh, personally, I think this is a little bit of an overreaction. Um, they still have a ton of talent on that defense. Chung's uh, grades on PFF weren't stellar last year. Um, so I think they, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like I've said that a lot overreaction on, on, on Patriots. So <laughs> other big mover, uh, when I looked at the most recent, recent numbers on FanDuel was the New York jets. 
So part of this was the opt-out. C.J. Mosley decided to sit the linebacker, but you can argue how much that had an effect because he barely played last year because of an injury. So the real reason for the movement with the Jets is that they traded away safety Jamal Adams to the Seahawks. Um, so he, he's a difference maker. Um, so when you looked at how the markets moved on the New York Jets, they were down about a half a point when I did my calculation for my preseason numbers. So is that symmetric? You know, I talked about how the Seattle markets had moved. They had moved up. Uh, did the Seahawks rise a half a point? Uh, no, they rise about a quarter point. So things might be a little bit off. If you love Jamal Adams, you think Russell Wilson is the, um, the best quarterback in the league, uh, you might want to give Seattle a look there. It was also interesting, you know, there was a lot more teams that moved up than moved down. So the market was uh, up highest on the Vikings, the Bills, and the Bengals. So they all made moves bigger than Seattle. Uh, I don't know if there's anything that's probably not an opt-out situation. It's probably just the markets liking those teams. Um, so, and uh, you can get the full numbers over on my site at thepowerrank.com. If you sign up for my free email newsletter, you'll get it uh, almost as, immediately after you sign up. What's wild about the Bills moving, and like this makes sense because, like you know, you mentioned the Patriots dropping a full point, the Jets down half a point. The Bills are now minus one seventy eight to make the playoffs, which is really, really short for a team that has Josh Allen as its quarterback. I get it, but yep. and I know that there's an additional team this year, but like. I feel like we might be getting a little bit too high on the Bills. Um, mm -hmm. Are you in a similar boat there? I've, I've never liked Josh Allen as a quarterback. I when I watched either. the kid play, I was absolutely stunned that he could possibly do what he did in the NFL last year. I mean, so, but, like, what he did wasn't even, like, that great. I think he was know, still, but, like... <laughs> but it's all relative to expectations. That's true. That's true. Right? Like, this guy was the quarterback on, like, one of the least efficient teams in FBS his last year at Wyoming. This guy like was you, like, if you asked an average NFL fan who had better efficiency marks last year between Josh Allen and Jared Goff, how many would pick Josh Allen? A decent number, right? Yeah, probably. It, it wasn't close. So like, right. I, I think that you want to try to take advantage of situations where the sentiment is divergent from reality. And I think right. like the bills, again, I get it. Like you said, like people are down the Patriots, with all the opt outs, Marcus cannon. Actually, that's a legitimate one. Didn't mention Danny Vitale. They're starting fullback opting out. Go cats. Uh, but like uh, it's, I get it, but minus minus one seventy eight to make the playoffs is so, so sure. heavy on them. Yeah. And, and the more, um, you know, the more I think about how I want to do my preseason process for the NFL, thinking about win totals, thinking about odds to win division, so on and so forth, the more it really does. Yeah, there's a lot of random factors that can affect the entire team, but like the quarterback is probably one of the most predictable things. Yeah. And, you know, Josh Allen doesn't inspire a ton of confidence. Later this month, we'll get into another quarterback that is not also not inspiring a ton of confidence uh, in me as well, which makes me, uh, you know, potentially want to go the under on that team. On the flip side, you know, I really, really like Seattle uh, under last year, even though they had Russell Wilson. Yeah, it didn't work out so well. So it really, you know, it's kind of like a broken record to say how important the quarterback is. Right. Uh, but the more you can dig into that, um, and, and that's informing more what I'm thinking preseason. The true takeaway here is uh, the Dolphins are plus 410 to make the playoffs. Let it ride, baby. Two a time. Let's go. Let's just do that. <laughs> what could go wrong, right, Ed? Uh, let's move into my cover in the future here because we can't talk more to it. I'll get myself into trouble, but we'll keep it in Florida because there is a NASCAR race down in Daytona this weekend. But it's not the Daytona you know. It's the Daytona road course. Uh, they're running that for the first time. That's, that's one thing, and it's an unknown but because of their COVID-19 protocols, they're not going to have any practice either. So basically what that means is the first time these drivers ever run this track in these cars is going to be under green flag conditions on Sunday. It's going to get wild. So that should make us want to look for a longer shot who could pull through with so much uncertainty. But I actually like one of the favorites here. That's Martin Truex Jr., who is six to one over on FanDuel Sportsbook. If you look over the past three seasons, the Cup Series has run eight separate road course races. Truex has won three of those eight, and he's been in contention seven of those eight races. 
One of the losses for Truex was in Sonoma in 2017. He actually won the opening stage of that race, but then uh, during the caution after the stage, he had electrical issues like his car caught on fire, which seems suboptimal, didn't finish the race. Another non-win for Truex was in Charlotte in 2018, the first race at that track, so we know he can do well uh, on this, you know, the first time at a new track. In that race, he was leading entering the final turn, but Jimmy Johnson had the super aggressive move, tried to pass him, wrecked himself, and then took Truex out too with him. So Truex in these eight races, three wins, two runner-up finishes, and two races he could have won if not for issues outside of his own control. Chase Elliott won both the races where Truex finished second, so I get why Elliott is a favorite for this weekend, but Truex ranks just ahead of Chase Elliott in my model. He has longer odds, and he will be starting higher in the order because he will start third while Chase Elliott is starting seventh. So I think if you want to take a swipe at a long shot, Matt Benedetto is 31-1, to starting ninth, good uh, track history on road courses, so you could go there, but to me... It's all about Truex, even at 6-1 to one, in a race with plenty of uncertainty. And I can't imagine the, the fear of having to drive a track with literally no practice on it when you're going, you know, 140 or whatever they'll be going in the corners. Like, it seems like not fun, but it will be fun, at least as a viewer, to see the calamity that indefinite, I- I- indoubtably will ensue in this one. Yeah, I guess that's the hazards of the job. Yeah, I, I do have to ask you though. What, what is your mo- did your model soften on Ryan Blaney or where, where's where's our guy this week? So he's nine to one, uh, which is annoying. Um, so, well, your model is nine to one, or the market was at nine to one. He's a nine to one uh, in the market. Uh, my model says closer to like twelve. But um, he, I was cooking on Sunday during the race, and so I had the TV on in the other room, and I was listening to it, and I heard Dale Earnhardt Jr. say in the fence. And Blaney was leading. I was like, he wrecked, didn't he? I All I heard were the words, in the fence. I didn't have to go to the TV. <laughs> I knew that he had wrecked. He wrecked because his teammate got, lost control beneath him and took it took Blaney out with him. That's, that's the way things have gone. I didn't even need to, need to see it. I knew immediately hearing Dale Jr. say, in the fence, that Ryan Blaney had wrecked. So... He, he did win in Charlotte uh, back in 2018. So that race where Truex got taken out, Blaney won that one. So maybe we could still go there, but I'm taking a one-week hiatus from my guy. And potentially two weeks because Dover's not uh, a great track either. So a one-week hiatus off of Ryan Blaney. All right. Sounds good. And again, if I hear the words in the fence, I'm just not going to turn the TV off right away. I want no part of it at that point. That is all that we have for this week here on Covering the Spread. Big thank you once again to Drew Dinsick for swinging by, breaking down his takeaways from the NBA's bubble and talking some NFL as well. Follow him on Twitter at whale underscore capper. Make sure you check out the Deep Dive podcast too. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? Yeah, I mean, I just updated uh, the NFL preseason market rankings. These are taking FanDuel's numbers and backing out a rating, which I use essentially all season to uh, for my NFL predictions. So you can get that at thepowerrank.com slash predictions. While you're there, you can check out some of the baseball predictions. And most importantly, I had a guy I think you know, Jim, uh, on the podcast. Uh, his name is J.J. Zacharyson. Oh, okay. I've heard, I've heard of him somehow. Yeah. He's, uh, he, he crunches fantasy football numbers. He writes about it. Uh, extraordinary fellow. And, um, yeah, it was a great conversation. Um, I, it was interesting because I, I don't – I mean, we talked about players on the way, but it yeah. was never a podcast where I'm like, who should I draft? Yeah, should, you know, like who should I draft in this round? It was all about his models, his thinking yeah. about stuff. We also got into why he continues to do season long fantasy football when there's so much DFS and sports betting going on. Uh, got into some more of his favorite books. So uh, really a lot of fun to, to talk to JJ. Um, it, the, the episode will be on the football analytics show. Uh, it might not be up by the time, uh, but by the time you hear it, it it's gonna. It, it'll probably be a little bit after this pod goes up, but it will be there. So subscribe, and it will show up in your feed. I've asked myself 
countless times why I still play season long. So I'm looking forward to that portion of the conversation as well. It's it's a burden. I That's that's what I will say there. Uh, so make sure you check out the Football Analytics Show to check out what JJ has to say. Uh, and follow Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank and check out his work at ThePowerRank.com. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. A lot of DFS podcasts over in the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed for NBA, NHL, MLB, PGA, and NASCAR. And I think there's a UFC podcast coming this week, too. So uh, make sure you are subscribed to the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed as well to get all that goodness. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for on the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Good luck with your NBA, your NFL, hopefully your college football bets. I don't know how that'll work out. But regardless, good luck to you, and we'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.